Okay, today we're going to do part three of constructing your life for victory. Today we're going to be framing the house. So now we've moved into another phase. Now everybody has to put their hard hat on now, okay? Because we're going up. So everybody has to put your hard hat on. Your helmet of salvation. Put it on and get ready to do some building. <laughs> Amen. Framing the house. Wisely, the overview, wisely build the house of your life solidly on the word of God to be victorious over the storms of these end days. Amen. So let's uh, look at our scriptures again. Um, I would ask you, if you would please, to go ahead and turn in your Bible because we're going to look at some scriptures that are not written uh, here in the, uh, on your outline. We're going to go ahead and start with verse 24. Therefore, whoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them. We're in Matthew chapter 7, verse 24 through 27. Therefore, whosoever heareth my sayings, these sayings of mine, and does them. And does them. So, the key to this whole teaching that we've been doing is being a hearer and a doer of God's word. I want us to look at a couple other verses here in Matthew 7 that shows the severity, that shows the importance, the gravity of being a hearer and a doer of the word. Let's start in verse 21. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Now one thing I want you to notice, go back to verse 24. What is the first, ver first word of verse 24? All right? It's the word, therefore. So we want to find out why it's there. What is the therefore, therefore? Because Jesus didn't just start a brand new teaching with this scripture, with this uh, verse 24, or brand, yeah, brand new topic. He was completing something he had started. We'll go back to verse 21 again. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Now this almost seems like a contradictory here. Because if someone is calling someone else, Lord, Lord, Master, Master, but yet he's not doing the things that the Master says, see, see the contradiction here? Just because someone is called Lord, just because you recognize them as Lord, just because you recognize them as the boss, but you don't do the things that you say, they say, you know, you're not going to be in that job very long. You know, you get in there and the boss says, okay, I want you to do A, B, and C today. And you say, okay, I will. And then you go and you do D, E, and F. Right? You're saying he's the boss, but yet you're not doing the will of the boss. He that doeth the will of the Father, that's the one that's going to enter into heaven. Let's go on. Verse 22. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord. So again, we're hearing the same thing. But boss, boss, you're my boss. You're my Lord. You're my Savior. And they go on, hey, and these, these people that are saying that go on. Have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name cast out devils? And in thy name done many wonderful things? marvelous works what's he talking about here he's saying lord lord but yet these people aren't doing the will of the father they are doing their own thing isaiah 23 talks about the prophets that prophesy in their own name they say they're prophesying in the name of the lord but it's their own words 
that they're prophesying. So just because someone prophesies, just because they're looking real spiritual, doesn't mean that they are doing the will of the Father. It may not be the voice of the Father speaking through them. Many will say to me, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name and in your name cast out demons and done many marvelous works? Something is wrong here in what these people are doing. They are not doing the will of the Father. They're not doing it in his time. They're not doing it in his uh, way. They're doing something wrong, not doing the will of the Father. Then he goes on, verse 23. Then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Wow, isn't that throwing another uh, item in there to, to show us? It's not just doing the will of the Father, but there is a relationship. Because if you're in relationship with God, you're going to want to do his will. You will look for ways to do his will if you're in relationship with him. It says, I never knew you. Depart from me, you that work iniquity. So they're prophesying. They're casting out demons. They're doing all those wonderful, marvelous works. Were iniquity, evil, twisted way of thinking. If you look up that word iniqu iniquity, it's not just, you know, we talk ar ar around here a lot about being a twisted or a wrong way of thinking about things. It's, it's more than that. There's, there is an evil connotation to it. So it's not just that they weren't uh, doing God's will, but what they were doing was evil. They, were, they thought they were trying to do what was good, but what they were really doing was what was evil, what was twisted, what was iniquity. So then he goes on to verse 24, and he says, Therefore, if you want to do the will of the Father, this is what you do. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them, and does them, I will liken him unto a wise man, which built his house upon a rock. And the rains descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded on the rock. And every one that hears these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto the foolish man that built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. So what I'm trying to point out here is it's not just doing good things for the Lord, it is being obedient to his will. Being obedient to his will. Now this phrase where Jesus used in verse 21 about he that doeth my will, uh, or does, does the will of my Father which is in heaven, uh, comes up several different times. You remember when Jesus was ministering in someone's home and People came up and they knocked on the door and they said, hey, you know, your, your mother and, and brothers are out here wanting to talk to you. And he said, who are my mothers and my brothers? He said, and he points to the crowd, he says, those who do the will of my father. So the same, the same kind of idea. It was very important for Jesus that we do the will of the father. Matter of fact, Jesus put it like this. In John 14 21 he says if you love me see uh, if if you love me if you have a relationship with me if you love me you will keep my commandments you will keep my commandments and then I will love you and the Father and I will manifest ourselves to you so here we see again doing the will of the Father and we do that by being a hearer of the word and a doer. Let's look at the same passage, the same event in Luke chapter 6. And why call me Lord, Lord, and do not think, do the things which I say? So that is Luke's uh, condensation of Matthew's 21 through 23 in chapter 7. So Luke condensed it into one little phrase. 
And why call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things which I say? Whosoever cometh to me and heareth my sayings and do, doeth them, I will show you to whom he is like. He is like a man which built an house and dig deep and laid the foundation on a rock. And when the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently against that house and could not shake it, for it was founded upon a rock. But he that heareth and doeth not is like a man that without a foundation built a house upon the earth against which the streams beat vehemently, and immediately it fell, and the ruin of that house was great. Now we need to be preparing our life, the house of our life, for the storms that are coming in this generation, because we live for this generation. We live in this generation, which is the generation of the coming of the Lord, the generation of the end days. And in constructing our house, we need to make sure that we are using God-given construction materials, methods, and tools. The most important of which is to be a hearer and a doer of the word. Now, we've already been through two of these teachings. The first one we talked about rendering the plans and preparing the site. So remember, when you're building, you always have to refer back to the plans. So as you're doing the construction, you've got to always go back. Now, am I doing it according to the plans? What is the size that's supposed to be here for this thing? What is, you know, is it accomplishing what we're trying to accomplish? The plans say it's supposed to have seven rooms. But when you've got this laid out here, there's only six. What's going on? We need to follow the plans, what it is that God has laid on our heart for our lives in order to be the, uh, the manifested Son of God and so on that we are to be in these end days. So we keep referring back to the plans. We also talked about preparing the site, the bedrock. We need to make sure that we are building our lives on the Word, that the Word is our final authority in everything. When any kind of event happens, when any kind of situation comes up in your life, always look back to the Word. What does the Word say about this? Don't get emotionally involved. Get Word involved when things come up. Think, wait a second, I'm upset. What, what does the Word say? The Word says I'm to forgive. Uh, you get upset because things aren't working out. Wait a second, the Word says I am to be patient. So we always look to the Word. And of course, in order to look to the Word, you've got to know what the Word says. So we study to show ourselves approved. We study the Word of God. Then the, the last, uh, last time we talked about laying the foundation. About laying the foundation. That the foundation is the foundation. The foundation is built upon the rock, but that foundation has to be solid in and of itself. Now, one of the things I didn't talk about last time was just like we talked about the first time about the footings need to be cured. Also, when you pour the foundation itself, it needs to be cured. Because if it dries too fast, it's brittle. It doesn't have the strength that it needs to have to withstand the things that could come against it. So you want to also cure the foundation. So how is cement cured? Well, the main ingredient in curing cement is water. You've got to keep water on it. You've got to keep it moist because if it dries too fast, if the water gets sucked out too fast, it becomes brittle. But when, it is, when water is allowed to be on the surface of it um, on a constant basis, sometimes for days, sometimes for weeks, depending on what you're trying to accomplish, when water is kept on it, allows the elements of the cement to bond together and it makes it harder and more durable so it can withstand whatever is going to be built on it. So what does that mean for us? We need to constantly be washing ourselves with the water of the word. See, when you are building this foundation, you want it to be as solid as possible. It is not a quick thing that just 
you put it together and, and keep moving. The, wor the foundation has to be solid. It has to be who you are. You've got to get it down into your heart, which means you've got to spend time with these concepts. We talked about the of understanding the gospel that you have been delivered. You have been, you have been uh, forgiven of all of your sins. And Jesus is on your side. We need to understand the identity that we have in Christ, who we are in Christ, what he has done for us, and who we are in Christ as a son of God, as a new creature in Christ, as a, the righteousness of God and being seated with Christ in heavenly places. We need to understand our salvation package. We keep flooding these things through our life. The word flooding our life, it what causes us to become cured and secure. We need to understand the armor of God. The armor of God is not just something you, you just put on and say, oh, don't I look cool today? I'm in this great armor of God. No, the armor of God is a way of living our life. It's something that we put on and we keep on. It's something that we know in our minds and we know in our hearts that we have the belt of truth, understanding that the, the truth of the life of God being released into us, the breastplate of righteousness, that we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, our feet shod with the gospel, that we are learning the gospel in order to minister to others, the shield of faith that is protecting our mind, that as we believe God's word, it keeps our mind from the wiles of the evil one, and the helmet of salvation, um, the sword of the spirit, and the prayer for the saints. And then we talked about the eight foundation stones found in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 5 through 11. And when you are practicing these things, the word says that, know that you will never fall. And so we want our house built on a solid foundation. So we need to study these things and keep going over them and letting them go through our, uh, letting the word go through our minds and our hearts on a constant basis so that it is so solid, so that the foundation is more and more solid because it's who we are. Now, on this foundation is where we now build the structure. We are framing the house. But before we actually get to the, to the work, let's uh, take a look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Because we need to, the word tells us there that we are to take heed how we build. So we, although we've already started this construction process, now it's, now we're starting to go up. Now we're starting to see the structure of our life takes, take place. So let's see what it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. We're going to start in verse 7. So then, neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are laborers together with God. We are God's husbandry, and we are God's building. Verse 10, according to the grace of God, which was given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let... Here's the, the phrase, but let every man take heed how he builds thereupon. Verse 11, for other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So the solidity, or solidity, so, oh, I'm sorry, we are to build solidly on the foundation of Jesus Christ. What does that mean? On what he has done and who we are in him. That is the foundation. We've already talked about that. Now we need to go on. Verse 12. Now if any man build upon the foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble. Verse 13. Every man's work shall be made manifest, shall be made clear, shall be brought to light. For the day shall declare it 
because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. So we need to take heed how we build. What are we building our life on? What are we building our life with? We, are, we can choose gold, silver, or precious stones, or we can choose wood, hay, and stubble. So what are we talking about here? Um, gold, silver, and precious stones. How do those come about? They come about by a refining process. A refining process by heat and often by pressure, especially the precious stones require pressure. So it is the trials of life that help to refine us. Another way of looking at this, it's doing the will of God. Because it's easy to just do our own thing. It's easy to just do good stuff for God. We want to do God things. And doing God things often require um, things that are refined by heat and pressure, like silver and gold and precious stones. James 1, 2 through 4 says, Count it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience, and let patience have its perfect work, that you may be complete and entire, lacking nothing. And that's what we want. We want to be complete and entire. And so the pressures of temptations, the pressures of trials in our life help to refine us. And as we allow that refining to take place, it is a way of building our life with what is priceless, what is precious, gold, silver, and precious stones. Or we can build our life with wood, hay, and stubble of little substance and of little value. And so when we build our life just doing our own thing, doing it our way, uh, the word says that once the fire comes, if any man, uh, verse 14, um, if any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. So when we're building with gold and silver and precious stones, something remains and we get a reward. But if any man's work shall be burned, in other words, all he's done is wood, hay, and stubble, doing it his own way, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. So we need to take heed how we build. It's important that we build with the right stuff, the stuff for eternity. You are the temple of God, and we need to build the best house that you can, one that has eternal value. So build your life towards the things of God and towards the things that are of eternal value value. So now let's talk a little bit about starting the framing of the house. One thing that is very important is that the frame has to be securely fastened to the foundation and we do that by hearing and doing the word. Remember last time we spoke we talked about in the foundation we put in anchor bolts so that we can then use those anchor bolts to help to anchor the frame of the house to the foundation. So we drill holes in the, uh, in the plate, which is the bottom board of the, uh, of the structure. We, build, we drill holes in those. We set those holes over the, the bolts, and then we tighten those bolts down the best that we can that needs to be securely fastened to the frame. Of the, the frame has to be securely fastened to the foundation. Why do we want to do that? To avoid cracks, avoid shifting, to withstand the winds, rains, and floods of adversity, and realize that it's, it all works as a unit. But I want to, as we go on here, I want to do something first. First of all, I want you to look around. All of you on the internet and here, you're in a building of some sort. Look around. Look around. I want you to point to me the, what, when you see the foundation, I want you to point it out to me. Does anybody see the foundation? No, you don't see the foundation. Okay, so now look around. I want you to tell me where the framing is. Do you, do you see the framing anywhere? No, you don't see it anywhere. 
the framing and the foundation are things that are hidden from those that see it from the outside. Right now, if we were to cut open the walls, if we were to go under the house or whatever, we can see the foundation of this particular building. That is really Im important for us to understand that. Because the building of our life, the solid foundation of our life, the foundation itself, the, the secure structure of the building is not built in front of others. It's built in front of your heavenly father. Nobody sees those things in your life. They see the results of it, right? Because we're standing on it. We see the results of it because everything on the walls and stuff is all supported by it. The flooring that we're walking on is all supported by it. That is the outward show of our life. What we're talking about at this point is still the internal structure. And that's where it is built, it is put together in our life by our time with the Lord, our time in the Word, our time in secret, in the secret place with Him. Letting Him build that solidly in our lives. Now people start seeing the results of it when they see the solidity of your life. But that doesn't happen except for in the quiet place before the Lord. They see your life as a result of that. So when we build the foundation of our lives on these things that we talked about a few minutes ago, and when we start doing the framing on the things we're going to talk about in a minute, so we are building the frame of our life, it's done in the secret place with the Lord. That's why it is so important that it be solid, completely solid. Because if not, the things on the outside, the things that you do see, will begin to break down. That's why cracks appear. Because if you see a crack in the wall, that means something either with the foundation failed, with the framing failed, something failed, and now you're seeing cracks. You're seeing disintegration. So what, what does that mean? What does that look like? It could be due to sin. I mean, how many ministries have we seen that looked like they were wonderful, great ministries, and then all of a sudden there is a crack that appears. Money has been stolen. Immorality has happened. See, that's because the foundation of their life, the frame of their life, had imperfections in it. It wasn't built solidly. And as a result, cracks begin to appear. Things in their life begin to fall apart. What we thought was a wonderful person, all of a sudden, because the foundation wasn't solid, it doesn't hold up. It doesn't hold up under pressure. We've heard of ministers that just, well, every day ministers are leaving the ministry because they can't take it anymore. It's too hard. The pressure of it is causing the foundation of their life, the framing to crack and, it, and fall apart. It's causing shifting in their life. It could also be due to error. They haven't built it on the word of God. And there's error in their teaching. There's error in their way of doing things. And as a result, cracks begin to appear. Things aren't what they seem. So we've got to build our life solidly on the word of God. The foundation of the word of God. The bedrock of the word. The foundations that we've talked about. And now the framing has to be solid. So let's talk about some items that could be part of the framing. Again, these are the things that are built so that the outward show of our life can hang on these things. You know, we don't live our life by what people can see. 
We don't put a show on for people. Our life is lived out of who we are in the secret place with Jesus. If you live your life so that others can see it, it's not going to work. That is building your life on the sand. Now think about these two houses. One that's built, that Jesus talks about. One is built on a solid foundation, on the rock. One is just built on the sand, on earth. Now when they're completed, they look the same. All the outward accoutrements look the same. They have the same crown molding. They have the same nice paint. They have the same, uh, you know, different things that they might put on there to enhance it, make it look good, the shutters and everything. It looks really great. They both look the same. But when the pressures of life start coming against them, what happens with the one, right? It begins to crumble because it has no foundation. So just because the, the house may look good, just because someone's life may look good, it, your life needs to be built on that solid foundation. So let's look at some of these things. What can you frame your life with? What kind of quality materials? For one, loving God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That there is nothing between you and God. You are loving him above all all. And Mark goes on to say in chapter 12, and loving others as yourself, for it's on these two laws, these are the two greatest laws, Jesus says, on these two laws hang all the law and the prophets. So it's important that we love God and are loving others. And we, let me remind you that we love God because we understand that he first loved us. And we learn that in the secret place with the Lord. That he is our father. Verse number three. We are then trusting God as our father. He is a good, good father. Every good and perfect gift comes from the Father of lights. And it shines down on us. He loves us with an everlasting love. He calls us the apple of his eye. And therefore, he wants nothing bad to happen to you. If you dwell in the secret place of the Most High, no matter what comes against you, you don't have to fear if there's... Uh, um, if there's... Uh, uh, explosions or bombs or, or anything going off. You don't have to fear. If people are mad and coming after you, you don't have to fear. Because he tells us that we are not to fear the terror by night, nor of the, of the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that walks in darkness, right? Nor of the arrow that, I mean, of the uh, destruction that, way, that comes at noonday. We do not have to fear these things. No plague shall come near us, uh, near our dwelling. And nothing by any means shall harm us. So these are things that show us God's love. So we need to put the full weight of our being on him. He is a good, good father. So if there's challenges that are coming, there are uh, challenges to your body, challenges to your finances, challenges in any way towards your life. It's not coming from God. It's not coming from God. It's coming from the evil one. And so we fight then with our spiritual weapons of warfare, knowing that God is the one that is on our side. See, when these things are in place in your life and you are now have a, a, a ministry you are ministering to others you are doing things in front of others then when challenges and trials come you what is being done on the outside is is hanging solidly on your trusting God and loving him as your father these are important truths. 
Develop a heart of righteousness. Love righteousness and good. Then when any evil tries to come against you, say, no, wait a second. I am righteous. I am loving righteousness. I am walking in righteousness. The fruit of the Spirit comes in here. The fruit of the Spirit, the love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, faith, humility, and self-control are built in and, and uh, become part of our life in the secret place with God. Now, people begin to notice it, but it is built in, in the uh, secret place, the fruit of the Spirit, humility and meekness. Although part of the fruit of the Spirit, I wanted to separate that out here because that is so important. We don't live our life in pride. Hey, look at me. Look what I can do. Look what I've done. No, we live our lives in humility, in meekness. Because when we humble ourselves before the mighty hand of God, he will exalt us in due time. When we humble ourselves, it releases the grace of God into our life. Purity is another aspect of how we build what we should build into our life, a purity, a pureness. G uh, Titus tells us in 115 that to him who is pure, all things are pure. And Matthew 5.8 tells us, as Michael so well put it on Friday night, that um, the, uh, blessed are, is the man who is pure in heart, for they shall see God. We need to submit to authority. Romans chapter 13 talks about the importance of submitting to authority. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God, no authority but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Verse 2, Whosoever therefore resists the authority, resist the power, resist the ordinance of God, for they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. So there is a consequence for not walking in authority. Now that could be authority to your doctor, if you're still going to doctors, could be authority to the civil authorities, you know, not speeding and, and obeying the laws, that kind of thing. In church, it means uh, being in authority under the pastor being an authority under, under uh, someone like myself who's speaking now. I mean, it would be inappropriate for someone to stand up and start waving their hand and trying to uh, gain control of the, uh, you know, of the floor. Uh, these kind of things would be inappropriate. And so you, we remain under authority, uh, an important part of building our life. It's an attitude. It's an attitude of humility. It's an attitude of trusting the Lord, of depending on him. You don't have to just try to make it happen yourself. You can be submissive to authority. Now, that doesn't mean you just give in to any whim of somebody. Now, one of the things that you can do is you can appeal to authority. You can say, you know, I know that you want me to do this, but at, say, for example, for a doctor. It says, okay, you know, your, your, um, your cholesterol is a little high, your blood pressure is a little high. I want to put you on this medication. You say, well... Doctor, let me, let, let's talk about this a little bit. I think I know some things I can do to help correct this situation myself. So instead of putting me on this medication, why don't we give us 30 days or 60 days? I'll come back in 30 days or 60 days. You can take the test again, and we'll see where it's at. And if there's still a problem, then we can talk about it further. And so you negotiate. You um, appeal to the authority. So you can do stuff like that. Uh, that's not inappropriate. But the basic, but see, even in doing that, you are submitting to them. You're not saying, no way, doc, forget it. I'm not doing it. No. You say, you know, you, you put yourself under their authority, right? So you say, okay, well, let's talk about it. Let's see what we can work out here. Another aspect of, of building our life is guarding our heart. Uh, Proverbs chapter 4 talks about the importance of guarding our heart because out of it flows all the issues of life. 
I mean, if, uh, if out of our heart flows all the issues of life, it's got to be protected because we want life coming out of our heart, not death. We, it says in Proverbs 4, my son, starting in verse 20, my son, attend to my words, incline thine ear unto my sayings, let them not depart from your eyes, keep them in the midst of your heart. Well, the way that things get into your heart, the way you bring things into your heart is going to be through the five senses, through your eyes, through your hearing, through the touch, smell, all these things uh, help us to interact with the outside world, which comes into our mind. But what gets it from our mind to our heart is when we start acting on it. So we want good things to be coming into our life. We don't be watching garbage stuff. We don't want to be exposing ourselves to uh, things that corrupt us. We want things that bring life to us. So we guard our heart by guarding our, our eyes, by guarding our ears, by guarding our minds. We're going on to verse 22. For they are life, talking about the word of God, attend to my words, for they are life to those that find them and health to all their flesh. Keep your heart with all diligence. The word keep there is another way of saying guard. So guard your heart with all diligence, for out of it are all the issues of life. So guarding our heart is an important aspect of the things that add structure and confidence to our life to be able to hold up the outward things that we um, want to have as part of our life. Okay, let's go on to letter E now. What is that I hear? Now, for those of you who have ever been in a, around a building project, let's say they're putting up a number of homes, the noisiest part of the whole process is the framing, right? Saws are gone and hammers are gone or nail guns or whatever they might be using. And so you just hear it all over, pow, pow, pow. Zoo! You know, all the saws are going off, everything's happening uh, as they're building the frame. And those kind of things should be happening. What is, it, what is the noise in your life like when you are framing and building your life? Well, now measuring may not seem like, uh, like it is very noisy. But the way that we measure, <laughs> it can be noisy because really it is prayer. We're wanting to align our life with the word of God. We're wanting to line our life up with the cornerstone. We talked about that from Ephesians chapter 2, that Jesus was the cornerstone. And it's the cornerstone that sets the parameters for everything in the building. It's, uh, it sets the, the, um, the direction that it, that it goes. It's, you measure everything off of the cornerstone so it stays square and level. And so we... Prayer is a way that we align ourselves with the cornerstone. We're praying about everything, asking God, how do I do this? How do I build this into my life? What do I need to do here? So it is important that we are measuring our life and measuring the things that we are doing by the word of God. Now, in doing so, you begin to realize there are things in my life that don't work, that don't fit, and so they have to be altered. And so they are altered by sawing, right? If you're going to put up a, uh, your um, two-by-fours for your framing, your studs, you're going to have to alter them because they won't necessarily fit. So you've got to cut them. You cut them with a saw. Let's talk a little bit about square, level, and plumb. We need to make sure if we're building a solid house that it is square, that it is level, and that it is plumb. Now, uh, my dad was telling me this story about this guy who was hired to fix a chimney on a house. Somebody had bought a house they were rehabbing, and they got this guy to uh, take care of the chimney because it had crumbled and it needed to be rebuilt. So he's, he's up there, and he's working all day, and he gets it all finished, and... and uh, 
the guys are sitting down there on the ground and they're looking at this thing and says, it's crooked. Why is it leaning to the side? And he says, they ask the guy, what did you do? Didn't you, didn't you take your level out there and, and make sure that it, was, that it was plumb, that it was square? He said, oh, no, I just used the horizon. <laughs> he was eyeballing it. Now, what's really funny about that, now, if, if he was building this at the beach and he had a true horizon, then maybe there might be some validity to that if he was really good at what he was doing. But I, I don't know about you, but I've tried to eyeball some things from time to time. And I think, oh, yeah, it's nice and square. And then I finish cutting it. And as I look at it, it's like this. this oh, boy. <laughs> Eyeballing is not the way to measure things. So if you want to make sure things are right, do it by the word of God. What does the word say? Because if you're eyeballing it, you're doing it your own way. You're being lazy because you, won't, you don't want to go to the toolbox to pull out the, the square, or you don't want to uh, go to the toolbox to pull out your, your level. But we can't be eyeballing things. There is a way that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof is death. The end thereof is death. We want to do it God's way. We're not going to be eyeballing our life. We don't want to build a house by eyeballing it because it's going to be really crooked. You start trying to hang things on it and, and you've got big gaps where, because it's not square and, it's not, and it's, uh, it's not level. Now, for those of us who live in the real world in our own homes, we have discovered this. You know, I remember, I think it was even here, um, I was putting a door up, I'd gotten a new, a new door to, to put up which, of course, the door itself is cut square. So I said, oh, great, you know, it's the right size and everything, just go and put it up there, and I look at it, and it's like, wait a second, this door frame is not square, right? So now I have to unsquare the door <laughs> to fit the door frame, um, which is uh, not necessarily a, a good thing, but we understand what it means when things are out of, of plumb. I was looking at, in the uh, bathroom at our, at our home the other day, and I was noticing that the, um, the, the wall had a, a bent, it was bent out, and you could see where they had just put the uh, molding around this, this bend, and I thought, wow, they re you know, I was thinking about this sermon, <laughs> I was thinking, wow, they really, they really messed up on that. I, I wonder what they did to get that thing so, so bent like that. Uh, anyway, we need to have our life line up be square, level, and plumb to the Word of God so that the things that we then display in our life, our ministry to others, our outward appearance is solid and it is not going to be looked at by people and say, what happened there? <laughs> so, <laughs> okay, so we've got prayer, we've got sign, which is done. Okay, now we're going on to sign. Sign, which is hearing and doing. In other words, it's conforming our life because we're coming up short. Our two-by-four doesn't quite fit. The stud doesn't quite work. Our life is a little bit too long or it's a little bit out of whack. It's the wrong angle. And so we have to conform ourselves to the Word of God by hearing the Word and then doing it. Remember the Word of God. It says all scripture is inspired by God. It's profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. Now, of those four, we like the first one, and we like the last one. We like the one that it is uh, profitable for teaching. We like to te learn and be exposed to what the God Word teaches. And we like the training in righteousness. Yes, let's be trained in righteousness. The way God does things and the doing things God's way. But the middle two we have trouble with, and that is... The rebuking, we don't like that the Word of God rebukes us and tells us where we've gone wrong and correct us. But that's what the Word of God does. So how do we get our lives in line? By hearing the Word and doing it. So we're hearing and we are doing the Word. We're conforming our life to the Word. And the next thing that you hear is the hammering. 
the hammering, as things are being put together, the nails are being put in uh, with a hammer or a, a, a nail gun or whatever it might be, our life is framed by the words that we speak and the word, capital W, that we speak. So anyway, Jeremiah 23, 29 talks about the word being like a hammer. Hebrews 11.3 tells us how God framed the world with his words. And so we do the same thing. We frame our lives with our words. And so we build these things in our lives that, can, that are the framing of our life by speaking the word of God over us. We speak it into, into existence. So if we're trying to build... Um, say, trusting God as our Father, we're trying to build that into our life, we can come up with um, some uh, affirmation that uh, every good and perfect gift, in the name of Jesus, every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights. So we, we uh, speak these things over our life. Or maybe we're having challenges in believing that God really loves me. Well, we can use John chapter 17, verse 23, that uh, God loves me as much as he loves Jesus. In the name of Jesus, God loves me as much as he loves Jesus. So these are things that we can speak the word of God into our life in order to uh, have the frame of our life come together. So what are the recommendations for phase three of the construction. Well, number one, keep using the tools that are in your tool belt regularly. And for those of you who don't know what those tools are, uh, they are confessing our sins regularly, speaking the word over our life with affirmations, being a hearer and a doer of the word, uh, prayer, and communion. So these are tools that we want to keep using on a regular basis. This should be part of our life, excuse me, part of our lifestyle. Number two, write out the quality materials that you need to use for the framing of your life. Number three, increase the time that you are spending in prayer on a daily basis. And number four, determine what areas over which you need to speak the word in prayer your life. So I hope this has been a help to you. We are next time we do this are going to talk about the finishing of the house, the finished work as our lives now will be shown to the world. But again, I want to stress the importance of building the foundation and the framing of our life in secret with your father. That is so important. You've got to spend time in the Word, time meditating on the Word. You know, one of the, the things that has become and is a, a foundation in my life is Ephesians chapter 1. You know, we were assigned, so to speak, to do that here. Um, is one of the prayers that, or scriptures that we should look at and prayers that we should pray on a daily basis which I began to do. But the more I studied it, the more I spent time in it, the more I spent meditating on it and thinking about it and uh, going and looking at other scriptures, cross-references and all this kind of stuff, I, it became a real foundation for me. Much of what I have taught has grown right out of that, of that uh, scripture about the importance of you know, our eyes being enlightened, our heart being enlightened, and uh, about who we are in Christ. That has bec that the whole series I did on becoming a manifested son of God all grew out of that study from Ephesians chapter 1. So spend time in the Word before God. Let Him build those things into your life. And remember, it's not a quick thing. We've got to keep pouring the water of the word so that the foundation of our life cures properly so it can withstand the challenges that
that are coming against it and do come against it on a regular basis. We thank, thank you and praise you, Father, for ministering your word to your people to, uh, this morning. Thank you, Jesus, that you will use it to bring light and life to each person. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.